Thank you, Victor. Um, our next speaker is Ayol Kazan. He's a student at uh, NYU. He's going to talk to us about uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and some interesting results related to baryonic acoustic oscillations in large scale structure in the universe. Okay, thank you, Mike, for, uh, you, Mike, for uh, the introduction. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here to talk about uh, uh, systems on slightly larger scales than before. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to talk about large-scale measurements of the universe, which are very interesting because we can infer from them the evolution of the cosmos. Uh, one of the main goals of my talk is that you'll uh, have better appreciation for this uh, illustration over here, which uh, kind of shows our current understanding of how the universe uh, has been evolving. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll do so by explaining how we use the distribution of galaxies uh, to learn about the geometry and the expansion of the universe and how we relate it uh, to this picture over here, which is the cosmic microwave background that you all per probably heard of, uh, which gives us a picture of the universe as it was when it was a thousand times smaller than the present. Uh, so when I was uh, building this talk, I was trying to think what I have most in common with people in this room. And the first obvious thing that came to mind is that we all like to solve problems. And in order to solve a problem, we need, we'd like to have as much information as possible to analyze. And at the end of the day, we want, we want to compare our results to some fundamental concept. Uh, in, in the next slide, I'll show a movie, but it runs kind of fast, so I'll just give a brief introduction to what it is. Uh, we'll be focusing on uh, an image of a uh, of galaxy, of whirlpool galaxy called M51, about 23 million light years away from us. And we'll be zooming out. And it's just to give you uh, a, a broad uh, idea of how much information is actually publicly available. And as we zoom out, we see a lot of little dots. Most of them are galaxies. And during this talk, I'll try to convince you we can use it to analyze uh, the universe on very large scales. So this movie, uh, uh, this imaging, is based on data obtained by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Uh, and this movie in particular was constructed here in New York University by my advisor, Michael Blackton. Um, yeah, so this slide over here is similar to the first slide that I showed. Uh, sur ongoing surveys, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, are measuring larger and larger chunks of the universe, transforming cosmology essentially into a precision science um, and one of the most important measurements is the way that matter is distributed, and we can relate it to uh, the cosmic microwave background, which I'll explain more in detail later, but for now I'll just give you a general idea of, of what you're looking at. These are, these are um, when we look at the universe when it was a thousand times smaller, we're looking at, sorry, we, we have this radiation that, that we're measuring all around us, and it's uh, radiation we can translate, of course, to temperature, and, um, and we measure the universe to be about at 2.73 degrees Kelvin, but we're interested uh, in where is it non-uniform, because it, uh, it looks pretty much homogeneous and isotropic. But in order to understand structure, we need some break, uh, breaking of the symmetry. And so uh, these are cold and hot spots that we see only after we take off layers at the uh, degree of a, hun of a thousandth of a percent. So that shows how uniform the, uni the universe was back then as opposed to the structure that we see today. Uh, so what you're looking at this movie over here, time is not evolving, but rather we're zooming in and now zooming out of the simulated light cone slice of the universe. This is a, a simulation of how we think dark matter uh, is distributed. So you see at large look back times, there's very little structure, and due to gravity, it builds up to the present day where the observer is. And so there's a lot of cosmological <coughs> information within the distribution of matter. For example, we can learn about the constituents of the universe. Uh, astronomers claim that, uh, that atoms and radiation contain only 5% of the energy budget of the universe, and I'll show you uh, why we think that. Uh, and we can use it to measure the cosmic expansion, and we can also test general relativity on very, very large scales. Uh, so this is uh, the outline of my talk. I'll talk about uh, uh, I'll talk about using two point statistics and measuring uh, the correlations between uh, the galaxies, and uh, I'll talk about this very exciting feature here within the autocorrelation function. It's called the baryonic acoustic feature, which is a firm prediction of our standard uh, um, Big Bang models, and it has recently been detected. This is my analysis. I'll also use uh, similar statistics uh, to explain why this plot over here is a way for us to test general relativity on very large scales. 
And I'll also say a few words about the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a revolutionary uh, um, survey that has industrialized in a very positive way um, the way we do analysis in, in astronomy today. Uh, so just uh, a brief background, the relationship between physicists and astronomers. For the most part, physicists have been telling the astronomers what they should be looking up in the sky. Uh, for example, black holes and uh, neutron stars for the reason that uh, the cosmos gives us extreme laboratories that we can't reproduce here on Earth. But here and there, there are examples where the astronomers are pointing up at the sky and telling the physicists about inconsistencies. Uh, a classical example is that, um, that uh, Mercury's uh, uh, evolution uh, uh, um, uh, around, around the sun, uh, Newton's uh, theory of gravity was inconsistent with that. And um, Einstein, the first thing that he did actually with general relativity, he posted it, uh, the precession of Mercury to, to see that his theory actually makes sense with observation. And of course, later on, it was a big triumph uh, due to predictions. Uh, so now we're in a similar situation in which astronomers uh, firmly believe that of the existence of dark matter. We still don't know what it is, and that's why we're pointing to the physicists to, to give answers and to actually measure it directly. Uh, dark matter does not interact with photons. That's why it's dark. We don't see it. But we can infer it uh, through various gravitational effects. And, the, uh, uh, and another even more mysterious uh, substance, we, we dub dark energy, which we use to explain why the universe is expanding the way it is. Uh, so why do we believe in dark matter? Again, uh, there, uh, here I just show a few of the many examples of how we infer it through gravity. For example, uh, how uh, the, the manner, uh, rotation curves, the manner in which stars uh, go around uh, their black holes, uh, uh, sorry, w within their galaxies, uh, the way that, that matter bends light according to general relativity, we call it lensing, and so we use dark matter uh, to solve these problems. And also motions within clusters, this is the poster child called the bullet cluster. Um, I will focus on, uh, in my talk uh, on the, the way the gal galaxies are distributed, and that's another firm condition of dark matter, uh, in, because the way it's related to the temperature fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. Uh, so, uh, if you're not up to date, well, we have been known, we've known for a while that the universe is expanding. This is a brief summary of the evolution of our understanding of this concept. Uh, so I'll just point out uh, major milestones, 1929, Hubble uh, uh, found an interesting correlation between the distance to galaxies to the radial velocities, and from here he postdicted that the universe might be expanding, but that's a postdiction. Uh, in order to convince the community, you need to uh, confirm a prediction, and that's what happened in 1968 here in Homedale, New Jersey, in which it has been predicted that we should measure uh, uniform radiation around us, and um, Pendus and Wilson measured just that. And then you can ask the question, okay, the universe is expanding, but at what rate? Um, and what threw everybody off is the fact that in 1998, uh, two independent uh, uh, research groups used relationships between distances and redshifts of exploding supernova and realized that the universe is uh, accelerating. And so that really threw everybody off and we're still, and various other measurements have confirmed um, uh, their conclusions. Uh, so how long has it been expanding? Well, for the better part of half of the age of the universe since, since the Big Bang. Uh, and there's also this, uh, the, the, at the very uh, early stages, uh, this era of, of inflation, which is consistent with current observations. So just to give you a feeling for what I'm talking about, here I show the scale of the universe as a function of time. And so we see that there's this, uh, this inflation era in which it's the universe is expanding really rapidly. And then we have this deceleration, which actually is the thing that makes the most sense to us. Because if you have something that's massive and expanding, you expect it to pull on itself uh, uh, j just through gravity. For example, take a grenade, let it blow up in space and, uh, without uh, anything going around it. So you eventually expect it to pull on itself uh, and, and decelerate in its expansion. So that's what happened when the universe was matter dominated. And what every, throws everybody off right now is that um, we're, suddenly the universe just jump kicked around um, uh, when it was about twice as small as it is today and it started accelerating, and we're still in that phase of acceleration. <coughs> and what we, we, uh, one of the things we want to know is, will it continue to accelerate in the same rate, or does that rate change uh, to a big rip, or maybe perhaps to a big crunch? 
And so those are things that we're interested in measuring. Why is the universe accelerating? Well, we don't know. Uh, just mathematically, we, if you put in Einstein's original fudge factor, the cosmological constant, then everything works hunky-dory, uh, but there's really no physical motivation behind that idea. Another, uh, uh, another uh, thing that people are, are working on is, is modifying general relativity. Maybe it breaks down at large scales. And that's something that I'll try to convince you that, uh, that, we, that we have a method of testing general relativity is the real deal, not only on solar system scales, but also the universe at large. And I'll do so by measuring the geometry of the universe. Uh, and so one of the, this plot here explains one of the confirmations for why uh, we believe in the existence of dark matter. Here I look at the, at the recent universe, the way the galaxies are distributed. This is a, uh, an angular map. Could we turn off the light? Or maybe look at the back. Oh, see. Um, and so here we look at over densities, which I'll soon define, which is order between 1 uh, to 10 to 100. Um, and that's what, so you see a lot of structure over here, but the structure that you're looking at over here, these hot and cold spots, that's again, that's at the order of a thousandth of a percent. And so in order to go from here to here, uh, just through the gravitational instability theory, we don't have enough atoms in the universe, but if you put into the <coughs> equation dark matter, then we do get this. Um, and yeah, so I, I mentioned that, the, that cosmology is in the age of being a precision science, and uh, this is uh, the leading theory, our Big Bang model, we call it the Lambda CDM, based on dark energy and cold dark matter. And just to give you an idea of what kind of plots we're looking at, well, if we look at result here, we're looking at uh, matter density versus the density of dark energy, assuming it exists. Uh, then if we look at re results from the temperature fluctuations in the CMB, large scale structure, this feature that I'm going to be talking about, the baryonic acoustic oscillations, uh, well, well they, they intersect, that's not too exciting, that's two lines, but if you add a, a third independent measurement, the supernova um, distance redshift uh, measurements, then you see that they all agree uh, uh, pretty much. Uh, we're still investigating this, but it is uh, very cool that we see that this uh, this model, based on very simplistic ideas, uh, is consistent with many observations. Um, so before I continue, uh, I, I try to keep at a minimum my, my, my astronomy jargon, but uh, there are just a few words that I'll, I'll be using time and time again, so I'll just <coughs> briefly go over a few important concepts. An expanded universe, how do you define distances, right? So we talk about co-moving distances, and uh, good enough, a good two-dimensional analogy in order to understand what that means, just to, uh, take a surface of a balloon, draw grid lines on it, and, uh, and, and points in the middle. Let's say that this is your Milky Way, and you're looking at two other galaxies in this expanding balloon. Well, let the, let the uh, balloon expand. Uh, well, now your grid lines are at larger distances, so instead of x, you're looking at a <coughs> times x. And in order to make sense of everything, you can just neglect, when you do your calculations, you can drop the A and just talk in units of X. And th so that's your co-moving distances, because that will be a constant in, in your expansion. Uh, so the units, I'll try my best to give everything in units of light years, because that makes a lot of sense. But astronomers are pretty much prone to using uh, parsecs. And so this is a relationship, a order of factor of three. I'll be talking about very large scales. So that's why I'll be talking about mega parsecs. And this H inverse, if you see it, just neglect it. That's just the constant that, we, that we use. Um, an important concept is redshifts. The universe is expanding, and so the radiation, so the wavelength in the, in the universe is expanding with it. So that's our proxy for distances, and so uh, that's also our proxy for time, because in relativity, time uh, and, and distance are related. And also, uh, I, I will uh, um, do the common blasphemy, in which we, uh, instead of talking I will talk about baryons as a collective for electrons and protons as opposed to dark matter. Um, so I hope that's all the jargon I'll be needing to use. So this is a nice poster which demonstrates on various scales how we think that dark matter is distributed. When you look at very large scales, you see that, uh, that it looks pretty much uh, uh, uniform, but as you go to smaller and smaller scales, right, I'm still talking about 23 million light years across, you see halos and you see filaments. As, uh, as, and so it looks like this uh, cosmic spider web, uh, which we understand due to gravity. And so you want to quantify this in some manner. So you can think of every grid point, you define the over density, meaning the contrast to the mean density. 
Um, and then uh, if you want to analyze this in the same way, you want to use endpoint statistics. So I, I focus here on the two point, two point statistic, uh, in particular autocorrelation function defined right over here. And what this means is that if at a given point x you measure an overdensity, it's the joint probability that you measure an overdensity at a distance r from it. Uh, and so this is what most of the plots will look like. This is the uh, scale distance r between two points, and this is the autocorrelation function. So it drops pretty much monotonically, as, as one expected to gravity falling uh, like r, r squared, inverse r squared. But uh, most of this talk, I'll, uh, I'll focus on this very exciting feature over here called the baryonic acoustic feature, which contains a lot of early universe physics within it. Uh, if you're more familiar with the power spectrum, well, the uh, transform, uh, Fourier transforms of each other, where this delta function over here becomes these ever slight wiggles. So in K space, um, it, it becomes wiggles. Uh, and so technically, what do I mean by calculating the correlation function? I'm not looking at a smooth field, but rather I'm looking at point dots, so, I'm, so I do have Poisson shock noise to worry about. Uh, so what we do is, is these, these are actually uh, location of, of, of galaxies that I use, about three giga light years from us. Here you have the scaling. And so what I do is I count galaxy pairs uh, within a given radius, and so I count these data, data pairs, and I compare them to a random, so, uh, a random catalog. And the points of the random catalog is you have boundary conditions and you have, you have this weird mask because, for example, you want to exclude bright stars and all kind of funky things that are going around there and sort of understand your mass, you want to populate the areas that you know that you should have measured a galaxy with a random point. And so you want, you want to use much more random points than, than your data points for obvious Poisson reasons. Uh, and so if I go back to my definition of the autocorrelation function, then our estimator in practice, I sort of have a hat over here like physicists like to use, is comparing your data data pairs to your random random pairs. Uh, and uh, it has been shown if you want to minimize your variance, a better estimator is comparing also your data random pairs. Uh, and so, so yeah, so unfortunately we can't see dark matter, it doesn't interact with radiation, so it's not luminous. And so we have to use luminous, what we call tracer, something that traces uh, dark matter like a tip of an iceberg to everything under the water. And so what we, uh, I focus here on galaxies, but there are other, uh, there are other sorts of tracers that people uh, are using to analyze. And we believe that it, uh, we have good reason to believe that uh, these, trace, these luminous tracers aggregate at the deepest potential wells of dark matter, and, and so that's why they trace the same structure, and we expect similar correlation functions. Uh, so I, I mentioned a few times the baryonic acoustic feature, um, and so right now I'll, go, uh, I'll rewind your brain to the, uh, to the early universe and explain to you the physics behind this feature so I can explain why, why it's such an exciting thing to measure. So in the early universe, it was very much homogeneous and isotropic. It was very uh, much uniform. But due to quantum fluctuations, you had these slight overdensities. Um, and so here, uh, I think a very uh, I I ideal case in which the whole universe is uniform except for, for this one uh, place at the origin. And so at the origin, just imagine that your universe consists of only dark matter, radiations, and baryons. Again, collectively, electrons and protons. Uh, and so what you have is, and here I show how, how they propagate outwards in a spherical motion. Uh, so as time evolves, you have the radiation propagating outwards. The dark matter stays in place, but the radiation does interact with electrons. So the pressing on the electrons, which are dragging with them the protons. And so collectively, they're this, uh, they're this plasma acoustic wave going by the speed of, uh, speed of sound. They propagate for about 100,000 years from the origin. But remember that at the same time, the universe is expanding and hence it's cooling down. And then the first atoms uh, 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 formulate. And so the importance of this is that suddenly the universe becomes uh, from opaque for the radiation, where they always bombarded and hidden things, suddenly the universe is, is transparent. And so the, 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 these photons that are propagating from here, we call this the surface of last scattering, actually are transparent and going up throughout the universe. And that's the cosmic microwave background that we actually see today. And so that was that firm prediction. That's why everybody was so excited uh, when they measured the cosmic microwave background. And so what this means is that the photons, again, they propagate freely. But as, as for the atoms are concerned, 
they kind of come to a halt and they leave this signature radius, uh, we call this the sound horizon, uh, in which now they're uh, bound uh, gravitationally to the dark matter, so the photons uh, keep on going away, but the baryons kind of stay in place, and, and, um, and again, they, 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 they cluster up w with the dark matter, and so this is the profile that you expect from the matter in general, and then you'll have this sl ever slight peak over here, and the importance of the, of the amplitude of the peak is that it gives you the ratio between how much matter there is, how much dark matter there is in the, rate the universe compared to uh, the regular atoms. And so, the, and so you have two scales. You have the amplitude and you have this uh, radius scale. And so both of them are important for our understanding. So before I show you the correlation function of galaxies, I want to get back to the, the cosmic microwave background. Again, these are temperature fluctuations. So we have cold spots in blue, red spots, uh, sorry, cold spots in blue, uh, hot spots in red. And so in the blue spots, you expect to have uh, uh, more matter. Uh, and so uh, this plot over here is one of the most, uh, I think, amazing measurements in, in astronomy, and perhaps in, uh, I don't know if I can say in this, in this audience in science in general, but it is very amazing that uh, th what you're looking at, these are the baryonic acoustic features within the temperature fluctuation. So, so the exact, so this is a two-dimensional projected K-space measurement in which what you're looking at, you're looking at, uh, at, the, at the correlation function uh, of these hot and cold spots. And you see that, that the lambda CDM uh, prediction, just this is based on, I think, six parameters or something like that, shows a very nice fit to, uh, to, the, to the data points. And so that's when I talk about precision science, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So this is the early universe. This is the age of the universe at 300,000 years. And we can relate that to, uh, to the recent universe. And this is a very exciting measurement that came out in my first year in grad school. Uh, uh, three people in NYU were co-authors in this paper, leading author Daniel Eisenstein now in Harvard. Uh, um, and so these are the data points. This is the correlation function I talked about before. And this is the feature. This is what, the, what they got back then. And this is midway through the survey of the SDSS. And comparing it to lambda CDM models, here different models, he just changes is ratio between omega and between matter and atoms. And so it's a very exciting measurement and a lot of, uh, and, and it, it caused a lot of excitement within the community. And many surveys are on their way to, uh, to, to follow up on this measurement. Uh, so again, just to summarize what he's doing, he's looking at how galaxies are distributed and going back to the, er the early picture of the universe, the early universe physics, in which you have this over density. Just think of like a dropping, uh, a pebble into a pond, you have this wave propagating outwards, <laughs> and they kind of think, uh, not a perfect analogy, but think that the, wa the, the pond suddenly freezes, and so you have this signature radius uh, around this over-density, and of course it doesn't happen in one place in the cosmos, it happens everywhere, and so by eye you won't see anything too interesting, you won't see these, these circles by eye, but statistically you expect to measure it, and that's exactly what he did, what they did, and so this is important uh, for two reasons. First, it's a very firm confirmation of the lambda CDM model and our understanding of the gravitational instability. And second, it's, it's practical because we can use it as a standard ruler. Why? Because it, uh, it gives us a signature, a characteristic length in the cosmos, which we can use. And so this is a good uh, cartoon to have in mind. If this is what I mentioned, the surface of last scattering, remember again, that's when the universe went from being opaque to radiation to transparent, uh, so we can, so so those those wiggles that I showed in, in, in the in, in the temperature fluctuations, uh, we can calibrate that as, as a standard ruler at a very high redshift, and then if we bring this ruler down to uh, to the recent universe, uh, if we measure clustering perpendicular to the line of sight, then we can measure the distance to uh, the mean of our galaxy. Why is that? Because this is simple geometry. If you know this distance, again, through uh, the cosmic microwave background, you know your observer's angle, so then you can infer the distance to the galaxy. So that's one thing you can do. Uh, an even more exciting thing you can do is measuring uh, clustering along the line of sight, and, what, and you can use that to measure the expansion rate of the universe, because measuring things along the line of sight is sensitive to the rate in which the universe is expanding. And so you want to measure clustering both tra transverse and in the, uh, the line of sight. Uh, so, like I said, many surveys are on their way uh, to uh, follow up on Daniel's measurement, 
And so Daniel's measurement, uh, so here in this plot I show redshift. Again, that's the look back time, how, how far deep in the universe you're looking. And this is the first uh, survey volume. Later I'll explain the importance why you want a large volume. I can mention right now, it's just you're looking at uh, modes in a box, and so you need a lot of large watch to measure perturbation mode. So Eisenstein's measurement was basically on this sample over here, just a, li a bit smaller in its, value, uh, in its volume. Um, uh, the, uh, there's an initiative in Australia called the Wiggles, and, uh, they, uh, and they recently reported measurement. And I'll show you, and I'll show you my measurements about just about up here, a slightly larger volume, and I'll show you predictions what we should be expecting by 2014 uh, by the next phase of the SDSS, a project called Box. Uh, so just to show you other independent measurements by the Wiggle Z Group and uh, the, the, another uh, Australian initiative, the 6DF, in which they all show a similar signature exactly where we expect it to be. Um, so, so yeah, so, so, so we have measured it, and we just have to bash down uh, the statistics by getting larger and larger uh, volumes. Uh, so this is my playground. This is the galaxy sample I've, I've been analyzing for the past few years. Uh, what you're looking at, uh, this is the sky distribution. It's about uh, one-fifth of the sky. Uh, this is an angular projection just to get a feeling for what's going on in the rail direction compared to the CFA, which in its day, it was a revolutionary uh, survey. So this is, uh, so we have, a, uh, we're looking far, much further back into the universe. And I'll show results on that, as well as predictions on the Baryonic Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey, or BOSS, which is going much further back into the universe. And it will cover up just uh, more uh, um, of the sky. And it's going to be three times as dense. And that's, of course, important due to uh, Poisson statistics. Uh, and so this this is my view spec. Yes. So but so in bus we're, we're gonna we're gonna the bottom line is we're gonna get a large much larger volume of the universe. I'll later talk about cosmic variance and explain how why we want larger volumes, but we're just gonna get a bigger chunk. But are you gonna still just uh, contain to the fifth of the uh, still keep You're just gonna look at the uh, same slide. Right? So, so, so sky coverage. It's going to be similar sky coverage, yeah, just right. about twenty percent more. But yeah, but we're going deeper. Yeah. Uh, so this is my measurement using uh, a more uh, uh, a larger volume than what Daniel got. So here you can see my data points, and you want to compare that to the Lambda CDA model, uh, the the the, uh, the blue line. All, all these uh, all these uncertainties are covariant, meaning if one point goes up, then all of them go up. Uh, and so what I what I did is I could pinpoint uh, I, I I found I could uh, measure the peak to an accuracy of about three percent and I could infer the distance to about three and a half million light years from here to an accuracy of about three and a half percent. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't mean to interrupt. But just as a quick clarification, the baryon acoustic feature was formed when inflation occurred, and then it's frozen in its current scale at the surface of last cavity. Yes. So, so this is measuring pre-inflationary cosmology to some extent. This is the distance, or the size scale that you're finding in this yes. peak is helping to constrain inflation um, or yeah. pre-inflation cosmology. Well, well, inflation predicts uh, uh, Gaussian in the initial condition. And that's something that people are still trying to measure. Right. So that's what, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Thank right you. now it is consistent with, with inflation, but there are ways of, of, of ruling out inflation. So uh, we, we're still at the phase in which we're collecting more and more data to uh, get better constraints. But yeah, but, but it shows that it is, it is consistent with inflation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Sure. Uh, so I mentioned a few times cosmic variance, and so that those are these gray bands that you're looking at. They're one and two sigma uh, uncertainties uh, due to the fact that even though we have a really huge chunk of the universe is still not large enough to make uh, precision measurements uh, such as these. And the reason is we're looking at perturbation modes within a box. And like any other modes in a box, you want to have a larger box to get more modes and so we get better statistics. And so that's why people are, uh, that's why uh, surveys are, are getting larger and larger um, um, volumes. Uh, so a few words, how am I in time? Okay, so uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, like I said, one of the most important sky surveys is today. Uh, today uh, it's based on a two and a half meter uh, telescope. Uh, 
in uh, New Mexico. Uh, they currently released their final uh, imaging uh, after, after over 10 years, the final imaging uh, has been released. So that's publicly online and this is what it looks like. Uh, so what they do, what they did, uh, uh, the first step was they image the sky. So that's kind of a, a blind process, they image it. And so that, that gives you, amongst many things, it gives you a two-dimensional mapping of the sky. Uh, and the next phase is you wanna uh, look, you wanna identify object, uh, you wanna identify objects and then objects of interest that you wanna get uh, spectra from. You follow up uh, by measuring the spectroscopy. And so, uh, there, of course, there's many things you can do with spectroscopy, like identifying uh, uh, elements, etc. cetera. Uh, from, but from my analysis, the most important thing that comes out is you get a 3D mapping of the universe, which is, which is, import which is important because through redshift, uh, you get a proxy of distance. And what I mean by redshift is that uh, many galaxies have similar <coughs> uh, uh, fingerprints. Like these are the, actual, this is the spectrum of actual galaxies that I use, the luminous red galaxies. And it just, if you, um, uh, the further away they are, the, uh, the more they're shifted, uh, Doppler shifted towards the red, and that's why redshift is a proxy for distance. And that's how we get our three-dimensional maps. Uh, and so just a few, uh, so, uh, SDSS in numbers, all, all this is available currently. So like I said, all the imaging is available. So that's summed up by about 60 terabytes in data. And uh, spectra-wise, everything's in like five and a half terabytes. And this is just a, um, uh, just a number of objects, which is, which is an amazing amount of galaxies, quasars, stars. Uh, so yeah, so back to science. Um, so I mentioned before the importance of measuring the baryon acoustic feature uh, in the line of sight in perpendicular, meaning as a function of angle, but yet I regarded angle so far. I averaged that out. Uh, and so now I'll talk about the importance of, of, of the angle and how we can actually use that in order to test gravity on large scales. And so what you're looking at over here is a very boring plot of what one would uh, measure clustering. This is a contour plot. Um, Looking, taking the angle into account, so the y-axis is the separation, the x-axis is the deviation from the line of sight. Meaning, uh, and so here you have strong clustering going down logarithmically, and so the line of sight is at uh, theta equals to zero. The baryonic acoustic feature in, uh, in this plot, if you were trying to look for it, then it would appear as a uh, uh, stripe over here, because you're going down, you have a bump. I should change my color code, because it's hard to see from where you're sitting. Um, and so the baryonic acoustic feature perpendicular to the line of sight, which you can infer uh, distances, is over here. And the feature along the line of sight, which you can infer the expansion rate of the universe, and hence analyze dark energy, is right over here. Uh, and so we will, not, we will never get a measurement like this in the universe. Uh, reason being is that I mentioned we use redshifts as proxies as distance. Uh, but we're doing one thing wrong in these calculations, is that we're assuming that galaxies follow the Hubble flow. But that's incorrect because they're also affected by local dynamics. And so, uh, so uh, an important effect is that imagine that you have a supercluster over here, and you have, have field galaxies, let's say 60 million light years uh, uh, away, and they're all being pulled inwards by, by its gravitational pull. And so this is in real space, what's actually happening in the universe. What we will see in what we call redshift space is that the ones on the, that the ones on the line of sight from the observer will appear to be more clustered in. So that means that we see things closer than what they actually are, and that of course affects your uh, correlation measurements. And so this, according to linear theory, what we will actually see in redshift space. So you see a lot of much more interesting features. For example, this negative C, here it goes negative at very large scales. Here at, at much smaller scales it goes negative. The baryon acoustic feature, which is a strip over here, is these funky looking ridges. Um, and so looking at end body simulations, now you see a lot of linearities uh, coming into play. Like uh, these ridges become much more wide in the baryon acoustic feature. You have non-linearities down here. You have a very similar trend over here. And this is actual observation. This is the largest measurement that we currently have of clustering of galaxies. And so you see we have this negative C. We have these nonlinearities on small scales. We have these, uh, these influx that we see uh, off the line of sight. So you see that we're in the correct direction, that we understand, at least in linear theory, uh, what's going on. Uh, and, now, and so on the one hand, these, uh, these redshift distortions, as we call them, they complicate relating between uh, the underlying, uh, um, underlying theory 
to, uh, to observations. But fortunately, as we do a lot of time in physics, uh, if we understand what's causing it, we can learn about the progenitor. So for example, uh, the reason for these distortions, again, are the influx of these galaxies, and that's due both to, to the matter abundance that's causing these velocities and to the other underlying gravitational theory. So that means that if we parameterize how much redshift distortions there are by this squashing parameter, we call it, we call it the squashing effect, uh, then we can use it, and th then it has been shown that it goes by the abundance of matter and by the underlying gravitational theory. So general relativity, for example, uh, will give you some value. And so that's a, that this is a parameter, this beta parameter is something that we're in very interested in testing. And so that's what I'm working on these days. Uh, uh, one test is using these observables where before if I focus on the angle average, meaning the monopole, I can compare that to the quadrupole, which is just, again, counting pairs. Now you're using a weighting of uh, the second Legendre polynomial to take into account uh, angular dependence. And notice that if these each independently depends on scale, according to linear theory, this combination gives you a right-hand side that does not depend on scale. It depends only on beta quadratically. Again, beta is a proxy of general relativity. What's the DGP model? The DGP model is, is a modified gravity for contesting general relativity. It was formulated actually in NYU uh, by three, profe three, three professors, uh, Bali, Gazzabe, and, uh, and Parati. Uh, and they're actually extending general relativity into six dimensions. And it's a way to explain the expansion of the universe, uh, the accelerating nature of the universe without the dark energy, but rather that energy is going into higher dimensions. Um, so yeah, so these, these, these are uh, results from n-body simulations. And so this is the statistic Q, meaning the quadrupole over the monopole. And as you see, according to n-body simulations at very large scales, it becomes flat, this sharp, uh, Signatures due to nonlinearities, which aren't taken into account in this theory, and so this is what we this is what uh, we get according to simulations, and uh, this, this, this variance is again due to the limited size of the, of the volume, meaning this is cosmic variance, and this is what I get currently with observations, and I'm still analyzing this, but you do see uh, there's no fitting over here. This is just the mock mean. I didn't do any fitting just to give you a perspective of what this means by flat. And so it's pretty, you see it's pretty much jumbling up over here, but it's on, on the correct scale. Uh, but you do expect it again due to this cosmic variance. Uh, okay, so I'll just summarize with these last few slides in which I tried, uh, I showed you uh, uh, measurements of clustering of galaxies using the autocorrelation function and using it to test the geometry of the universe through this very exciting baryonic acoustic feature, which has been detected in various surveys. SDSS were the first ones. And um, so uh, these gray bands is our current cosmic variance. So this is, um, so it's not a significant measurement yet, but uh, it's definitely, we are getting, we're seeing exactly what we expect to see. And we can use this to test geometry. Uh, for example, we can measure distances and the expansion rate. So this is current uh, kind of constraints that I get from simulations. I get to do it on the real data. And I, I, I talked about the fact that you can use these two-point statistics also to test general relativity on very large scales do this beta uh, uh, measurement. And so now I'll fast forward to 2014, what we expect to get from the next phase of SDSS from the BOSS project. And this is from simulations. This is the cleanup that we expect to see. So I'll uh, just toggle between them, and you can see how much, uh, again, this is due to the fact that we're reducing cosmic variance. Plus uh, also uh, Poisson statistics, because we're using, we'll use a sample three times as dense. You expect to be like 600 terabytes for the Oh, I never looked into this. I don't know. Um, well, 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 actually, yeah, I, 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 I can't. You said they're now. Well, I can't can, can can say, because they finished already all the imaging, so there won't be any more imaging. And most. And most of um, what comes to terabytes, most of it goes into the imaging. So that'd be already finished. Yeah. Uh, the, next, the next phase is only spectroscopy. The SDSS has four projects. Uh, the, uh, the boss that I talked about, and also measuring uh, planets, and, uh, and, and analyzing also the Milky Way. So uh, those two, two projects that do that. So, um, but imaging-wise, they finished. How long um, did they come to take on the individual spectrum? What? How long did they take them to take on the individual spectrum? So that's a good question. That, um, so the minimal, I think, is they, they look at each object uh, 15 <coughs> minutes times three, uh, but then they have, to, but it has to go. It goes by signal to noise. Yeah, so a certain threshold in which they want to measure, 
And so then they decide on the stock if they want to take more time at a given point or they want to move on to the next region in the stock. That's not a while. It, it's, it, it's highly multiplexed. Yeah. Okay. That was okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes? Many times. Uh, I'd like to follow up on just the original, the physics of the acoustic peak itself. And okay. forgive me because my understanding is so shallow. If you go back to the previous plots where you showed your peak at about 110 megaparsec or, or there, thereabouts, uh, what is the original peak way at zero? In other words, you're going all the way up. That's the original. Is that the Big Bang? Well, yeah. that, that's, a, that's so. So imagine the universe is right. Is you go back? You have quantum fluctuations. So the quantum fluctuations. Could you, go, could you go just go back one or two slides real quick so we can see? Or is that uh, too late? I'll do it just after I just put. Uh, yes, please do. Yeah. Presentation. Oh, okay, you're not done yet. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I thought when you put that up, you were already finished. So. No, I have just two more slides. Yeah. Sure, sure. Uh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah. So, so as I promised, uh, my, my, my goal was to have you uh, have a better appreciation from what's going on here and the. This is our current understanding of the evolution of the universe from the surface of last scattering. I did talk about what happens before, uh, what generated these, uh, these hot and cold spots. And basically, this <coughs> is the structure that we see today in the form of dark matter. We don't see dark matter directly, but we use tracers. Uh, for example, I use luminous galaxies and uh, use that to infer the geometry of the universe through the expansion. The universe is accelerating, and so we can use this uh, to measure is this modified gravity or is this dark energy. Um, and for those of you who are interested in, in, are interested in the SDSS, and this is the site, sdss3.org, uh, so feel free to, to go around. If somebody wants to be active in, 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 in some way, then a cool project is called Galaxy Zoo, a side project of the SDSS, in which it's one of these trends that they're using the public to analyze data because uh, uh, the human mind today is still better than computers at identifying objects. So they help you, give you, off. you don't need any background in astronomy. They train you for whatever they need. For example, they show you a spiral galaxy. Is it going this way or is it going this way? So they use all, do all kinds of st uh, cool statistics like that uh, to learn about. Um, um, and they have over, just about over 300,000 users already worldwide. Um, so yeah, so that's my talk, and I think we'll talk offline about um, about your question. That's a, how, how much time do we have? Uh, I think like two minutes or something. Maybe we could have another. We could have one more question, maybe. But Charles, you've already asked a yes, tough I question. Yes, I let other people. <laughs> yeah, if fine. nobody else has any questions, we can. Add. There's one right behind. Uh, okay. Quick yes. question. Um, so you're using the two-point correlation function. Yes. What's the? Is there been any advances with using more points or yes. pattern matching circles or? Yes. Like that. Yeah, so people have been publishing the three point correlation function, for example. And that's, uh, that, uh, it, it's important because, for example, uh, if you want to measure the filaments in the universe, you can't do that with the two point correlation function because it totally disregards that. But if you have three points, then you can see are they aligned in a filament or are they distributed in, in, a, in a more random uh, fashion. So, yeah, that's a good question. And there's actually more, uh, more things that one can do with, with higher order statistics, of course, but also it's, it's much more complicated. Yeah, um, we have complicated math. You have to kill your motion. 